from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Newland. I'm Deputy Librarian of Congress. And on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Library of Congress. I'm so glad to see so many of you here tonight for the presentation of the 2016 Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry. Before we begin, I'd like to note that we are recording this event for the library's archive and for all to see on our website, and would ask that you please silence your cell phones and any other electronic, uh, electronics you may have with you. The Bobbitt Prize is awarded every other year to recognize the most distinguished book of poetry written by an American poet over the last two years or the lifetime achievement of an American poet. With so many great poets working today, that's really no easy distinction. We are indebted to the jurors who read through over 120 submissions from publishers large and small for this year's prize. Betty Sue Flowers, former director of the LBJ Library Museum and emeritus professor of English at the University of Texas at Austin, has anchored the panel for many years as the Bobbitt family representative. Boston Poet Laureate Danielle George was selected by our own po Poet Laureate, Juan Felipe Herrera, and the Librarian of Congress selected National Book Award winning poet, Mary Zevis. To all three jur jurors, we thank, we thank them for their hard work. I would also like to acknowledge the publishers of this year's co-winners, Grey Wolf Press and New Directions Publishing, two of the nation's powerhouse independents. And finally, thank you to Dr. Philip C. Bobbitt for his generous gift that makes this prize possible. Professor Bobbitt is one of the nation's leading constitutional theorists, the Herbert Weschler Professor of Federal Jurisprudence and Director for the Center for National Security at Columbia Law School, a distinguished senior lecturer at the University of Texas, and most importantly for us tonight, his parents shared a strong connection to this wonderful institution. To tell us more about that, please join me in wel welcoming Philip to the stage. It's been my great pleasure these last almost three decades to say something at these gatherings about my family and especially about my mother, in whose honor this prize is presented. Becky Johnson of Johnson City, as she was when she met my father here at the Library of Congress in the 1930s. My parents' story is a Washington story. Here they fell in love during the Depression here, they reluctantly left when the war began. My mother didn't really want to leave Washington. One of her suitors had bribed the orchestra leader at the Shoreham to play the Yellow Rose of Texas whenever she came to the ballroom, and she wasn't going to get anything like that in Austin. She had, in fact, escaped Texas, and I don't think she really wanted to marry a man from Texas. But they eloped to Mexico. They lived together mainly in Texas for 38 years until my mother's death. When she died, I found a cache of some unusual index cards in a pigeonhole in the small green writing desk where she did her correspondence every day. Each card had a hole drilled in the center of the top line, and on each was typed poetry, or in some cases, a rather lofty saying. I took them to my father, and I said, uh, what are all these cards? I mean, there are dozens of them. He said, you remember that I met your mother at the Library of Congress when we were both working our way through school. My father won a scholarship to come east to college from uh, Texas. My mother was studying library science, as it was called then. Father said to me, 
you know that your mother was engaged to, an, to another man when we first met? I said, uh, yes, uh, I sort of remembered. Thank you. Uh, technophobe, meet technophile. <laughs> I said, yes, I, I, I do sort of remember that. A Princeton graduate, I, I thought. Uh, well, I had to dislodge this fellow, but the only time I ever saw your mother was at work, and we had a very strict supervisor. We worked in cataloging, and those cards are from the card catalogs. Do you know how to explain the holes? They really, in fact, belonged on the bottom of the card. And we would exchange notes as if we were typing in reference information. <laughs> I've always had a certain affection for the Dewey Decimal System since I heard that story. Anyway, my father and I sat and we talked, and out of that conversation that afternoon came the idea of the Poetry Prize here at the library, a prize which is now in its 27th year. 27 years ago, my father and I came to the Library of Congress with a librarian and the Poet Laureate to honor James Merrill, the first recipient of the Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt Prize. If the function of poetry is not to inform but evoke, as the classicists tell us, perhaps you will recognize something in the following short poem by James Merrill, something other than the Villon, which you'll all recognize, something of the season that has just passed and perhaps lingers still in this town. It's called Snow Jobs. X had the funds, the friends, the plan. Wise Frank Grin was our common fate, or maybe just a flash in the pan. Z, from the tender age of eight, had thirsted to officiate. We hardly felt them disappear, the crooked and the somewhat straight. Now, where's the slush of yesteryear? Where's Teapot Dome? Where's the Iran-Contra affair? Where's Watergate? Liddy, Magruder, Ehrlichman, their shoes squeaked down the halls of state. Whole networks groaned beneath their weight till spinster Clotho darted near to shroud in white a running mate. Ah, uh, where's the slush of yesteryear? Like blizzards on a screen, the scandals thickened at a fearful rate, followed by laughter from a can and hot air from the candidate. With so much open to debate, language that went in one ear came out, oh, well, hush, be delicate. Where? is the slush of yesteryear. Omniscient host, throughout your great late shows, the crystal wits cohere, the flaky banks accumulate. But where's the slush of yesteryear? Well, that from Jimmy Merrill. Depending on how you count, this is either the 14th or the 16th prize to be awarded. That's because tonight, as only once before, the library is also awarding a Bobbitt Prize for a lifetime achievement in poetry. So I thought I might just close by saying something about how that particular prize came about. The members of my family have never been and should not be involved in the selection of the winners for this prize. We're not poets or critics or editors of poetry. And besides, the juries that have selected past winners have done pretty damn well. Merrill, Glick, Strand, Ammons, Coke, Bedart, Ferry, Fulton, Fairchild, Merwin, Wright, Hickok, Perillo, Smith, Stern, what a list. Robert Pinsky, our three-time poet laureate, said, and I quote, no other literary prize has set such a high standard, end quote. And this year's winner, Claudia Rankin, rightly joins this remarkable collegium. Of her work, Citizen, one will not hear what a witty critic once said of another long poem, this book will be read when every other volume of poetry published this year has long been forgotten, but not until then. <laughs> For in fact, Citizen has been a smash success. Nevertheless, there were poets whose work we loved and hoped would be recognized with the prize given in my mother's name. Howard Nimeroff was one, but he died shortly after the prize was inaugurated. Anthony Hecht was another, and when he died, also without ever having won. I discussed the matter with some of the persons here at the library who were familiar with the selection process. Uh, uh, Ms. Brown may be one of them. 
Well, they told me, the person chosen for the Bobbitt Prize has produced the most distinguished work in the last two years. Those poets whose work you love, Philip, may not have done that. Some of them may not even be writing now. So for this reason, it was decided to create a prize for lifetime achievement. Naturally, I assume this would go to an older person, by which I mean older than I am. <laughs> I was an only child of somewhat older parents, the youngest grandchild in my family. Being a bright boy, much brighter than I am now, I was always the youngest in my class, in my schools, in my college. One consequence of this was that I've unconsciously assumed that at any gathering, I would be the youngest person. It's not that I thought of myself as particularly young. I just thought of everyone else around my age as older. So imagine my shock to realize that the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award is a fellow I went to college with. But you don't win the Bollinger at 27, do you? Nathaniel Mackey would have been 27 at the same time I finished clerking and moved back to Austin to live with my parents in a large house and take up a professorship at the university in Austin. We were a very close family. But none of us knew how little time we three would have together. Or were there four? For I haven't mentioned my beloved Mary Lewis. One ought to be circumspect in discussing the suffering and oppression of others. It never looks the same from the outside, whether it's an earache or a racist remark. American slaves were not settlers, and they were not immigrants. They were brought to this continent in chains and maintained in their condition as chattels. But that does not change the fact, so often ignored, that the U.S. would not have thrived, would not even have successfully managed its independence without the African Americans who came here against their will. I don't know all that we owe those original generations of African Americans and therefore owe their descendants, or even the best way for us to discharge that obligation if I did know. But I know this, that African Americans have always had a right to be here, that they have, in Sam Houston's words, watered the soil with their blood. And it is a source of some dismay to me that many don't feel fully invested in this country, don't feel that it is properly and rightfully theirs, not just as a matter of equality, but as a matter of birthright. Mary Lewis came to work for my family a few months before I was born. I was a large, lazy baby, and my mother was tall but not strong. So she was there every day and many nights. She traveled with us and toted me around the world. In the end, she stayed with us for over 40 years. I talked to her daughter yesterday. And although we were very close, it wasn't because of me that she stayed. It was because of the bonds she had forged with my mother. Now, my mother was a woman of her time and place. She was no egalitarian, and I think she disapproved of most people's behavior, white or black. But she was close to Mary Lewis in a way that's hard to describe. It has something to do with there being women in a world of headstrong men, and something also with their shared love of punctilio and style. We know from antiquity that the birth of a society comes in crime and pain. Think of the rape of the Sabine women, for example. But whatever our desperate origins, we have created an enduring society when so many others have failed. We should take pride in our endurance, and not only endurance, but that we have prevailed, all of us. One nation out of many, under God, still seeking liberty and justice for all. Our little daughter is about 27 months old. She's the eighth Rebecca in our family, named for the woman this prize commemorates. What sort of past will she reflect on when she and her brother stand where I'm standing to present this prize 27 years from now? Like the physicist, <clears throat> I'm an optimist, by which I mean I think the future is uncertain. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for supporting the library's tradition of honoring poetry with this prize in your mother's name. 
In 2008, the Bobbitt Prize was split between Bob Hickok for his book, The Clumsy Living, and future poet laureate Charles Wright for his lifetime achievement. This was the first time the prize honored uh, both categories, and now, nearly a decade later, a pair of poets merit this recognition again. I am pleased tonight to award the 2016 Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry to Claudia Rankin for her book, Citizen, and to Nathaniel Mackey for Lifetime Achievement. In complementary ways, both of our winners argue for poetry as an essential way to invent myths and interrogate institutions, champion the music of direct speech and the complex lyricism of meaning, and give shape to our imagination. Rankin's book, Citizen, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Forward Prize, and the Jackson Poetry Prize, achieved a rare feat for poetry. It reached and moved a mass audience in this country and around the world. The Washington Post called Citizen part protest lyric, part art book, and a dazzling expression of the painful double consciousness of black life in America. Book Forum added that Citizen is an anatomy of American racism in the new millennium, a slender musical book that arrives with the force of a thunderclap. And finally, Robert Newland says, Citizen is an astounding collision of verse and visuals. The National Endowment of the Arts recognized the enduring power of Citizen when they added it to their nationwide Big Read initiative last year. The year before, Yale University award the Bollingen Prize in Poetry, the library's first poetry prize, as well as the model for the Bobbitt Prize, to Nathaniel Mackey. The Bollingen judges declared Nathaniel Mackey's decades-long serial work, Songs of Odambulu and Mu, constitutes one of the most poetic achievements of our time. Outer Pradesh, jazz-inflected, outward-riding, passionately smart, open and wise, beautifully continues this ongoing project. Mackey's many other honors include the Poetry Foundation's Honor for Lifetime Achievement, the Ruth Lilly Prize. In his citation for the prize, Poetry Magazine editor Don Scher noted that Mackey's poetry ambitiously continues an American bardic line that unfolds from Leaves of Grass to Pound's Cantos to H.D.'s Trilogy, winds through the whole of Robert Duncan's work, and, ex and extends beyond all of these. Mackey's own rare combinations create an astonishing and resounding effect. His words go where music goes, a brilliant and major accomplishment. We could not be more grateful to celebrate two of America's trailblazing poets tonight. Please join me in welcoming Claudia Rankin and Nathaniel Mackey. Good evening. Whenever I come to Washington, I feel like I come to America. It's very, very, very monumental to be here. Um, I, I would love to thank the Bobbitt family for this prize and, and everyone at the Library of Congress. And, and also, um, it, I cannot communicate to you how honored I am to share this evening with Nate Mackey, whose work has been behind my own work. So I'm much younger than he is. I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he has been so important to me over the years. So it's a double honor, a double honor. I, I was thinking about what Mr. Bobbitt said about the future being uncertain. And that is probably the most 
optimistic thing I have heard in a long time. I'm going to read three poems from Citizen. The first poem um, is in memory of James Craig Anderson. Uh, he was killed by Daryl Deadman in 2011. And I've been thinking a lot about young white men who are caught by white supremacy inside a kind of disassociation from their own humanity and from humanity in general and from America as their country and this sense that they would rather become murderers than share this country with um, people of color it seems to me um, a kind of wrong, wrong-headed equation around a sense of feeling lost and disaffected inside our landscape. I read, I recently read um, the journals of um, Jalen Roof and he, 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 they're fascinating if you have a Sunday afternoon um, to read them and he said, he said that killing those nine people in Charleston was something he had to do. And he knew that he would have to go to jail. But he also felt that he would be pardoned. Which is the one of everything I read, it's the one thing that um, I, I haven't been able to forget because it is a sense of a certain um, world uh, that has come into power and that sense that that world will save him. In the next frame, the pickup truck is in motion. Its motion activates its darkness. The pickup truck is a condition of darkness in motion. It makes a dark subject. You mean a black subject? No, a black object. Then the pickup is beating the black object to the ground. And the tire marks, the crushed organs, then the audio, I ran that nigger over, is itself a record-breaking hot June day in the 21st century. The pickup returns us to live cruelty. Like sunrise, red streaks falling from dawn to asphalt. Then again, this pickup is not about beauty. It's a pure product. The announcer patronizes the pickup truck. No hoodlums, just teens, no gang, just a teen with straggly blonde hair, a slight blonde man. The pickup is human in this predictable way. Do you recognize yourself, dead men? In the circulating photo, you are looking down. Were you dreaming of this day all the days of your youth? In the daydream, did the pickup take you home? Was it a pickup fueling the road to I ran that nigger over? Baldwin says, skin color cannot be more important than the human being. And was the pickup constructing an exploding whiteness out of you. You are so sorry. You are angry. 
an explosive anger, an effective one. I ran that nigger over. James Craig Anderson is dead. The pickup truck is a figure of speech. It is as the crown standing in for the kingdom. Who told you it was a crown? Did we tell you the pickup was as good as home? You are so young, dead men. You were so young. James Craig Anderson is dead. What ails you, dead men? What up? What's up is James Craig Anderson is dead. So sorry, so angry, an imploding anger. It must let you go. It let you go. Hello. Sorry. No, no. It gets the best of us. I um I wrote this poem about a month before Trayvon Martin was killed. And then someone said to me, you wrote this for Trayvon Martin. And so, I mean, it came out sort of after he died and people said to me, oh, you wrote this in memory of Trayvon Martin. So I decided that I wrote it in memory of Trayvon Martin. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves or rescued. Then there are these days each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through these brothers, each brother, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets. And as yet, I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother. I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers. Dear heart. On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, another dawn, where the pink sky is the bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless. Shush. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling of one in three, Two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony. Accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging. The rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots, our limbs, a throat sliced through, and when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms. Oh, blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, dear brother, that kind of blue. The sky is a silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. 
My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking, the talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot, is it cold? It, are you cold? It does get cool, is it cool? Are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is a silence, eventually, he says. It is raining, it is raining down, it was raining, it stopped raining, it is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there. He's there, but he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up, don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. And the final piece, so that we can get ourselves some name Becky. <laughs> some years, there exists a wanting to escape. You floating above your certain ache. Still the ache coexists. Call that the imminent you. You are you even before you grow into understanding. You are not anyone worthless, not worth you. Even as your own weight insists, you are here fighting off the weight of non-existence. And still, this life parts your lids. You see you seeing your extending hand as a falling wave. I, they, he, she, we, you turn only to discover the encounter to be alien to this place. Wait, the patience is in the living. Time opens out to you. The opening between you and you occupied, zoned for an encounter. Given the histories of you and you, and always, who is this you? The start of you, each day, a presence already. Hey you, slipping down, burying the you, buried within. You are everywhere and you are nowhere in the day. The outside comes in. Then you, hey you, overheard in the moonlight, overcome in the moonlight. Soon you're sitting around, publicly listening. When you hear this, what happens to you doesn't belong to you, only half concerns you. He's speaking of the legionnaires in Claire Denis' film, Beau Travail, and you were pulled back into the body of you, receiving the nothing gaze. The world out there insisting on this only half concerns you. What happens to you doesn't belong to you. Only half concerns you. It's not yours, not yours only. And still, a world begins its furious erasure. Who do you think you are saying I to me? You nothing, you nobody, you. A body in the world drowns in it. Hey you, all our fevered history won't instill insight won't turn a body conscious, won't make that look in the eyes, say yes. Though there is nothing to solve. Even as each moment is an answer. Don't say I, if it means so little. Holds the little, forming no one. You're not sick. You're hurt. You ache for the rest of life. 
how to care for the injured body. The kind of body that can't hold the content it is living. And where is the safest place when that place must be some place other than in the body? Even now, your voice entangles this mouth, whose words are here as pulse, strumming shut out, shut in, shut up. You cannot say. A body translates its you. You there. Hey, you. Even as it loses the location of its mouth. When you lay your body in the body, entered as if skin and bone were public places. When you lay your body in the body entered as if you're the ground you walk on. You know no memory should live in these memories, becoming the body of you. You slow all existence down with your call, detectable only as sky. The night's yarn absorbs you as you lie down at the wrong angle to the sun. Ready, already, to let go your hand. Wait with me. Though the waiting, wait up, might take until nothing whatsoever was done. To be left not alone, the only wish, to call you out, to call out you. Who shouted you? You shouted you. You the murmur in the air, you sometimes sounding like you, you sometimes saying you, go nowhere, be no one, but you first. Nobody notices, only you've known. You're not sick, not crazy, not angry, not sad. It's just this, you're hurt. Everything shaded, everything darkened, everything shadowed. Is the stripped, is the struck, is the trace, is the aftertaste. I, they, he, she, we, you, were too concluded yesterday to know whatever was done could also be done, was also done, was never done. The worst injury is feeling you don't belong so much to you. Thank you very much. to the Library of Congress and the Bobbitt family for bringing us here. Um, Claudia and I read together 15 years ago at the University of Chicago with Ed Roberson. So it's nice to be reunited. Um, the um, phrase, lifetime achievement, 
has a rather ominous ring. <laughs> and um, I, I'm going to read um, recent work that hasn't been published in book form yet. Um, I'm not done yet. Um, and um, I just wanted to let you know. Um, the poem I'll begin with, uh, since we're here in Washington, D.C., um, it's the last poem in a volume that will be called Tejbet. And it's, I only work, uh, I only write, you know, a couple of poems. One is called Song of the Andumbulu, and the other is called Mu. And they go on. Um, the book that uh, I most recently published, um, Blue Fossa, ends with Song of the Andumbulu 110. And Tejbet ends with this one, Song of the Andumbulu 160. And um, those of you acquainted with the work know that it's come to be a kind of um, song of migration, uh, the migration of a traveling group known as we, in a, a country called Nub, that bears some resemblance to this country, a world, a, a planet called Nub, which bears some resemblance to this planet. And this one um, was recently published in The Nation back in the fall, even though it, it was written a few years ago. It was actually uh, written around the time of the midterm elections. Nub's pendular politics took our wind away. Suff was all sigh, exasperation. We'd sat on a beach biting hard apples during an earlier go-round. Nothing we knew amounted to much. Only this or that oscillatory witness, a topography of grief, regret rolled out under our feet. I thought of Netsonets, low-hanging hips, and the honey-based perfume her night garments had given off. Lineage of wind, the book Sophia wrote us into again and again. The word we thought meant injury, meant winding, we found out. I wanted whatever might last to last, knowing nothing would. The words ersatz eternity as close as we ever come. The words conjoint rehearsal, each the other's fecund recess. I wanted not to be yelling what was wrong, but I was. Mama too tight might have been on the box but I wasn't sure. So it was, or so it seemed, or seeming so, it made me reckon. Warble to one side, moot clamor to another, a worrying of all it was we knew. One would know the quality of what I fled by my awayness my doctrine held, doctrinal as I had let myself be, not very. Awayness turned all doctrine away. So went my rescinding of souls, weak resolve. Nubs rescinded steps, inoculant. A mirror might I have gotten it to look. So it was, I wasn't the only one yelled what was wrong. Nubs forward steps, in consequence. Nubs turned back on cue. Nets and nets, pliant hips, a remote planet, honey waft, my head let lift it there. I was older now, Annuncio the Elder's avatar, be he mine as well as me his. Nub's raw cry rubbed us bloodless. Gauge and more gauge I reached into. A nested set, some recollection lay inside. I requested a song my reluctance to sing built out from, song number 40 times four. Song number four to the second times 10, four to the third times five divided by two. Song I'd be tied in knots announcing whose number, song nubs temporizing led me to. 
Nets a net fresh from her bath, I remembered. Balm against nubs, regression. Regressive itself, no matter. Soft cloth suffused with perlier honey. Skin so suffused as well. All as if light years away, so remote it appeared. An unreal world, or another world, or another life, mine though it insisted itself to be. I was older now. Annunzio the Elder's avatar, he mine as well. Nub's pendular politics, endless. Waft what respite, honey haunts would be regime. So said song number four times 80 divided by two. The song a reluctance to sing set forth. Song so undone by Nub's pendular politics. Nub's back and forth so much more back than forth. Song I made myself breathe in, not wanting to sing. Suff, one with suffusion. Suff, nothing but soul. Soul, nothing at all, if not respite. Legs netted, we were time's catch. Reminiscent kiss, reminiscent caress. Nets and nets, musk, recombinant. Recombinant. Song, number four times 40. Song 320 divided by two. All was number, abstract figure, cipher such as we with no skin to be had remitted, more than we'd have seen or admitted we saw. Song number four times four times 10. Song number 10 times two times eight. Song sung high on the moon without wind, suff, some distension it seemed. Was it us getting old or the world, everyone wondered? Abstract figure, an icy falsetto. Song number 80 times two. A true institute of sentiment, it seemed. Reminiscent regard, reminiscent regret. Tutored feel, tutored feeling, memory escalated. Release come to haunt, release come to heal, release newly other to itself. Snub, nubs, buns, Itamar spat. Pure permutation. Abstract figure, abstract fig filigree, abstract lace. Snub, nubs, buns, Annunzio spat. Last love song, seven. Abstract boast, abstract bluster, would be dispatch. We were spinning our wheels. Beginners again. Splinters pricked us on the ass on the learner's bench. Each of us a fool come off a hill as off a throne. Snub, nubs, buns, a, a lesson we learned by rote. Snub, nubs, buns, part past, part secret pledge, said as if never to be heard again. Funny time no sooner rose than faded. Lucky for us who were otherwise unlucky. Nubs new cathartics, a rumble in our stomachs, outside in, in out. We were marking time, led by nubs temporizing, legs netted, fish with feet it seemed. We were marked by time, run to and fro, nets and nets crew, reaches will be done our sweet tooth wish. What thus we'd have come to, we could only guess, going on the need to go on. Nub-like, I wanted the past back. Nets Net visited me in a dream. I told her I think about her often. She said to me not to tell her that. Sweet figment of one day when we were young, it meant I was a nuncio of the elder again. Autumn's tally lassoed my legs. Hooves at whose ends would have been fish feet. Song number four score twice. What to go on but the need to go on kept at us. Buzz inside and out we were put on by. It was a question we swung at, wanted to knock down, a question we waved away as we could. Crossroads called us out, loomed at us, legba, lassoed our legs. Netted were we fish, roped were we cattle, 
Psalm 640 divided by four. Pure figure, pure form, pure permutation. We knew Nub's minions gun us down with impunity. Was it time or a particular time we wanted out of? Time itself tainted, never not particular. Time's particularity, the rope we were caught by, net we were caught up in, we needed to know. Song number two times two times two times 20, roundabout numbering, naming, name where none was before. A late entry in the book of So, her diasporic soulmate, the wise one or the wounded one, her diasporic soulmate he'd be. The wise one or the wounded one walked holding my hand beside the ledge. I bit my lip, feeling him trudge along so. I held back tears. The wise one who was also the wounded one. Wise to what end, I wanted to know. Which of us was the pilgrim, I also wanted to know. No way, something told me, were we both. On into the enveloping fable, deeper it insisted we go. The thing that was happening, all of it, the it of it, the something somehow telling it, the tale we'd come to know. Up late, watching election results back when, lineaments like none Sophia sensed. Calling it names, nub, stub, flub, scrub, no release, no matter. Honey musk, maybe a match, but no matter. Hellbound, Ithamar said, I said there already. The poverty of politics would be with us always, Aja put in. Bounty be found all the same. Thought of Netsonet crowded the room, the night, bomb where none otherwise was. Calm came over us, to divine between legs what recompense we who were not always meet in bomb. So it seemed, and seeming so, so it was. Young wager come back to be real, all I took to be Tejbet. Nub, never not with us, never not prod, pebble, pearl, there'd eventually be. Okay, um, this is um, the poem that follows that poem and the book that follows that book, which is called So's Notice. And it's a book, it's a, it's a poem in the Moose series. Um, I've developed this habit of writing about bands or creating bands in my writing, in my prose, famously so, but it's also something that started to happen in, in, my, in, um, in my poems. Uh, air bands, I guess you would call them. Um, and one of them that has come to be is the Overghost Orchestra. And this poem is called The Overghost Orchestra's Next. And um, this poem actually led to a, a talk, a lecture, a paper that I, I wrote called Breath and Precarity. Um, it was written after um, uh, the uh, killing of Eric Garner and his last words, I can't breathe, uh, which has become a, uh, a rallying cry. And um, I was thinking about how much breath gets expended, expended in black music, which is one of the things that has buoyed us up over all these decades. And the phrase, uh, no matter we couldn't breathe, we blew start as things to happen. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about living in North Carolina now is that uh, I got to visit uh, High Point, which is where John Coltrane grew, grew up. And uh, I actually found the address of his old, of the house he grew up in and went by there and visited and was happy to find out that it was right around the corner from the Toussaint Louverture Mason Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> that comes up in the poem towards the end. Nub's new facelift got old, war droned on, 
money stayed on top. The abandoned boy and girl went by every name known. Still, we bit the bullet and blew. I will be and I'll believe when I blow, we announced. I will be and abide by sound, my slave day done. We were back on St. Sufferhead's porch, a promontory. Some same tunes temporizing remit, reminiscent romance. The pharaoh's black torso reached for and found. Polis plied us arrows again. We were the pharaoh's black torso, lost and found again. Thick reed stuck to a dry lower lip. Chapped kiss calling itself song, all sibilance. Some same tunes high cry. We were the pharaoh's black torso cloaked, a call for cover, shot body, sirening alarm, we lost and found again, pantomimes, loose Raymond. So it was, or so we said, or so we played, canting say so, torn cloaks rule unrelenting, torn cloak routing the day. Could we but be a band, it would all go away, we thought, or we played like we thought. Could we but be a band, it would all be okay. So it was, we were in a band, so it was not so the same. What we cut, we'd call a release, release what we called out for. It had been going on for only a minute. It had been going on for as long as we knew. Nub said to be having a conversation. No such one were we in. Unable to breathe, though we were, we blew. The crook of Nub's arm on our necks. We played with our hands up, axes untouched. Release, it was Tedge's bet, would be sweet. Nub held my neck in the crook of its arm. The unworded song we sang said. Nub took me down, but I was swinging. I got up swinging. Could we only band or bond, we thought. But it wasn't so. Together, as we were, we suffered original sufferheads. Original sufferheads for all eternity, it seemed. Wise ones and wounded ones, it seemed. The empathetic string ensemble skipped out. A gig in the Czech Republic, they said. So it was we were on our own, erstwhile accompaniment, the ground we got up from hot light spiraling behind. Pulling thread from string, string from rope, we'd have been had they been there. A fraught way to feel, a fugue for the wretched, blows to the head as we blew. Hands up, windpipes crushed, we blew. Over ghost embouchures, behest. A high falsetto wind put parts in our hair again. We heard bells, an avid choir breaking glass. They hit such high notes. Heads, all honey house, it seemed. Choked, held, haloed, we wanted to say, but came up short. Hot light popping sweat, no matter the high wind, no matter where we were, wherever it was we were. Hot light away, we dwelt elsewhere. It was never just there we were. Wherever it was we were, we were birds again, each with our own song, each with a tutor song. Teach me, tutor me, we sang. Notwithstanding we couldn't breathe, we blew. A Masonic windpipe we resorted to circular breathing with, we blew. Louverture, we called it, church key, millet beer, wet, what words there was. It was an underground Pipeline, we got our breath back through. Teach me, tutor me, the words there were. Thirst a way of knowing, not knowing. Gnostic, more stoic now. Our first day in the land of the dead it was. Breathless though we were, we blew. Took a stand, we were taken down, we testified. Arrest what of earth we remembered, all else taken away. So went the record, what we read into the record. New tears for Eric, new tunes for another Eric. Commiserative, our posthumous release. 
Live in the land of the dead, we might have called it. Notwithstanding, we couldn't breathe, we blew. No matter we couldn't breathe, we blew, we kept insisting. Overghost tremolo, overghost vibrato, overghost cul-de-sac, come to and come back from, overghost conversancy, no end. In the heart of Nunak Yet, west of Egypt, no matter we couldn't breathe, we blew. No pitch, no tone, pulse only. A Tudor song, police batons taught us. Hexameters tapped out with a stick. Liner note. The idea was we were dead, already dead. Always the saying went, already dead. The idea was we blew, not yet knowing we were dead. To blow was to hope against hope we had air. No matter we couldn't breathe, breathe in, breathe out. No matter we couldn't breathe, keep breathing. The idea was we were a claim the dead made. The idea we were a strain put on the living. The idea was time turned back, put its back to us, back at some serial onslaught, back at us again and again. We convened around the corner from Coltrane's house, the Two Saint Louverture Masonic Lodge. Acknowledgement hit, we bowed our heads. It was nothing if not love's arcade, and we wanted that. The idea we'd rounded off with that. Live in outer space, we might have called it. Why they send us off the planet so soon, we wanted to know. Demanded someone say, got no answer. Lynch laws return, had it ever left. Nightsticks and nooses, no new facelift now. Breath, even would be breath, our eventual escort. Hydraulic circles we blew. Better born a dog in nub, we squalled, calling up step, even so. Giant steps, no, not even steps, step. Step said everything, all that would out. Hit, hoist, hover, hover, high cyclonic stare, step. Thank you. Thank you both for a terrific reading. Uh, and now we have the final, final part of our little reading and ceremony here. I'd like to welcome again the, the Deputy Librarian of Congress, Robert Newland, to come up. And our two winners. And Mr. Bobbitt, please come up too. We'll fit everybody up on the stage. We got everybody? Okay. Um, the Library of Congress is pleased to award the 2016 Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize in Poetry to Claudia Rankin and to Nathaniel Mackey. Thank you. Thank you. in the back uh, by both of our wonderful prize winning poets. Please buy them. They will sign them at the table over there. And please fill out the surveys that were on your chairs. And you can leave them on your chairs or at the tables in the back. It's useful for us to know what you think about our programming. Next Wednesday, our poet laureate, uh, Juan Felipe Herrera, is giving his final uh, event. Please come to that. You can check it out at www.lsc.gov poetry. Until then, have a good night. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.